morning, guys. Um, remember, I'm, I'm the basic guy, um, which, I mean, puts me a bit in a tight spot because um, you may have noticed yesterday our school collectively leapfrogged to the advanced level. Um, at least, I mean, if that was basic yesterday, I don't know, want to know what will be advanced by Friday. Um, so, um, yeah, to cut it short, I, I want to uh, call a vote. Um, so what, what is going to happen is today I will just continue very slowly uh, discussing symmetries and um, progress to, from symmetries towards uh, topology. But then, I mean, the material I originally uh, prepared, I mean, if I, if I proceed as planned, it will involve a lot of repetition because uh, much of what I'm going to tell has been implicitly or explicitly used um, yesterday already by, by uh, the other lecturers. So um, uh, plan A is I continue... I mean, as originally planned, that will involve repetition. It will be boring, certainly, to some of you, but if um, others may feel they have some problem with following yesterday, I mean, maybe it's helpful to hear things twice. I mean, Dirac Hamiltonian approach to quantum anomalous Hall effect, stuff like that. Um, the other option is um, I drop that. I trust that sort of it will sink in any way. And I uh, give you an introduction to the physics of static disorder. Um, in topological quantum matter. That promise will also be basic. I mean, it's not, but it will be just different. So, who wants to follow root one? And root two? Oh, it's almost a draw. <laughs> in which case, I can decide, right? Or shall we? So, I mean, the, the disorder stuff, you don't hear that often. So, um, shall, shall we go for that? I mean, the yeah, Hamiltonians. You will see. Um, right. Um, okay. Now, um, okay, let, so let's now begin. Now comes another vote. Um, I give you a Hamiltonian. I ask a question, and I want to answer, I mean, you, to answer it quickly and, if necessary, instinctively, but give an answer. Yeah? So here's a Hamiltonian. Uh, H equals delta there you are. and um, delta is uh, minus delta transpose. So you have a superconductor Hamiltonian without any further structure. I mean, spin triplet superconductor. What symmetries? Charge conjugation symmetric? Yes or no? Who is for yes? Please don't be shy. I mean, and hands up, I don't see anything. Okay, side merge. Particle hole symmetric. No? Also some. No symmetry at all. Nobody. Okay? So let's investigate. Yeah? Um, according to uh, what I introduced um, last time, um, this guy, oh, where are my notes? Uh, this guy is uh, charge conjugation symmetric. And. Um, uh, that follows from the following. Just let me find my right page. Mm. Yes. So um, you can define um, a matrix tau x acting in number space. And then you realize that h equals minus tau x h transpose tau x. And that is um, an anti-unitary operation, the transpose here. Um, which reproduces the Hamiltonian up to a minus sign. So according to the table, this is actually C plus 1, because this operation squares to 1. Yeah? So C plus 1, charge conjugation symmetric. But now um, I want to argue a little differently, and I write this guy in a second quantized representation. Yeah? So let's, let's write it like this. Um, and I discriminate between the first and second quantized by a carrot. Yeah? But they are the same, of course. Free fermions. So um, I can write it like this A H B C B plus C dagger A delta A B C dagger B plus emission conjugate. Okay? Agree? And if we write it like this, I would argue this is the most dump as Hamiltonian you can write down. It's totally stupid. It it is structureless here. And it doesn't even know about particle number conservation. So it, it, it doesn't have any symmetries. Yeah, agree? That's a valid point of view. 
So the, what I want to advocate is that indeed this Hamiltonian in the first quantized representation looks as if it had some charge conjugation uh, symmetry and it has physical consequence. I mean Majoranas, for example, rely on that. But um, from a fundamental perspective, um, this has really, it's a Hamiltonian which is totally symmetry-less. And it is, um, I mean, to avoid the confusion I alluded to last time, it is really, um, it is well to, uh, to, to know these two levels um, of, of description. So let me now introduce to you time reversal and charge conjugation again, but this time in a, what I would call physical, um, namely second quantized setting. And um, we can then uh, um, discuss how first and second quantized levels um, interrelate to each other. And I, I mean, there, there is no uh, one-line answer to, to or summary of what is going on, but, but it's good to know these two levels. Yeah? So, um, quick um, excursion into symmetries um, in a second one as representation. That's what you find in most particle physics textbooks. Unfortunately, particle physicists only know Dirac and young Mills theories. I mean, they, they only talk about these, so they will always specialize at line one to Dirac particles. And, um, but, but you can discuss all this in a more general setting, which, however, maybe some of you know. I don't know any good reference whether it is to be found. But anyway, I mean, um, the thing is that we have two fundamental symmetries um, in, 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 a, in this setting, which is relevant for us. First of all, there's time reversal. And let me uh, denote this by this fancy um, T. And we ask now how it acts on a second quantized operator. And um, it acts in the following way. It acts in the adjoint. I mean, you, you, ha you have, this is our, another way of actually writing the time reversal operator, which is, acts now as follows. Um, it does, in general, involve an anti-unitary matrix. In most cases, this will be the unit matrix or Pauli matrix, sigma 2. Uh, excuse me, unitary, unitary, yeah, some unitary matrix. And then you get here CB. So it looks as almost, this would just reproduce the second one as operator up to unity, but this is anti-unitary acting. So which means that whenever you have a combination like this, you are supposed to complex conjugate. Yeah? That's time reversal. <coughs> and um, there is a um, natural partner action on the creators, which is um, CB. Uh, just has here the complex, complex conjugate of this mat matrix element. Okay, um, now there is particle hole symmetry. Um, particle hole or charge conjugation, these two are um, terms anonymously. Um, so th this guy here reverses time. That's um, wh where we need this from. The job of charge conjugation is to invert all quantum numbers. All quantum numbers get inverted and um, it goes like this. Um, C. And what does C do? It also involves the unitary, which this time I write as UC, a different one possibly. And by convention, I put here a complex conjugation, just matter of convenience, convenience, A, B. And then it transforms our annihilator into a creator, and unitary. So there is um, C, C inverse is C. Um, some people claim, and I don't know where it comes from, that it should act anti-unitarily in the literature, but I mean, this will, time will answer, but I mean, and this shows that there is confusion around. I mean, in the, in the forums, you see lots of discussions of this, but most people will agree it's unitary operation. Yep. So, Yeah, I think so. Yeah, just. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe this is more general and it, con it changes charge in particular, but it also changes other quantum numbers. All right. Um, now, uh, we can also then write down C, C, um, Mega, and um, A, and this is by convention C, B, C, B. And so these are our symmetries. Um, and now uh, we call um, an Hamiltonian is um, C or T symmetric. 
if um, um, now, yeah, if uh, ch c inverse or th t inverse equals h and no minus here. Yeah, so this is really a, 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 a proper symmetry, um, either unitarily or anti-unitarily implemented, but there is no minus signs um, of, of any kind. Now, um, it is, I mean, yeah, let, let, let me write this, um, let, let me write it in the perhaps more interesting case of C, what this means, yeah? Um, oh, what, I mean, we can ask now, what does this symmetry imply for the first quantized guy that is um, sitting in the middle? So um, let's do this um, as an access or uh, example. Um, so I write down something like that. B, yeah? and um, act on it with um, C inverse. And now, um, uh, well, I can write this as C, C, A, dagger, C inverse, H, A, B, and this is a number here, um, C, C, B, C inverse. So here's the number. Notice that in the time, if I did this exercise for time reversal, I would get this number here, complex conjugate, yeah? because of this anti-unitary nature. But now it's just this number. And um, now you, you see how it goes. I mean, we plug in these definitions. And then this gets essentially replaced by CB. Yeah? Oh, it's a matter of convention. You, uh, and, and it's much more physical. You, uh, Hamiltonian is particle hole symmetric if you particle hole exchange the creators and you get the same answer. I give you an uh, example. In a second. So we have this here, and um, now if we substitute this, uh, we get here essentially a dagger. And then we bring it up front because we want to get back to the original representation, and that gives us a minus sign. So it comes from Fermi statistics. So if you, if you plug it in, you will find that this is minus CD dagger, then U um, charge conjugation inverse H U C with a transpose. The transpose I also need because I I, I, I swapped I swap orders. Um, D C C C plus a constant and this constant vanishes uh, for tracer semitone needs. The constant comes from um, uh, Fermi statistics. If A equals B I get something. So you see that um, our Hamiltonian is, uh, gets reproduced if the first quantized guy equals that one times a minus. And that's our, um, the, the way I introduce this symmetry. Okay? With time reversal, it's um, the same story, um, except that there would be no minus sign here. So that all looks pretty compatible. Um, we have... Uh, we have seen that the physical symmetries imply these combinations um, we discussed um, the, the other day. But there is a catch. And um, the catch is as follows. Um, so are, are you with me so far? To this point? Um, the catch is, uh, let's now go back to our example, which I wrote earlier, this totally structureless, non-particle number conserving Hamiltonian. You will not find a meaningful operation of this guy acting on the Nambu. You can try, but I mean, it's a good exercise actually to, to try to prove me wrong here. Um, uh, so you can try to find an operation of this type, anyone, which gives you a meaningful relation of this type. Ah, fuck, oh gosh, that was painful. Uh, in that particular case, yeah? It just doesn't exist. So that, that Hamiltonian is formally, it, on the first quantized level, it has a, a formal you can write down a formal relation. It, I would call it formal. Other people use different names. I mean, a constraint relation or what. But it's not a physical particle hole symmetry. Now, let me give you um, an example of one that is actually physically particle hole symmetric. And then you, you can see what the essence of particle hole symmetry really is physically, what it means. And probably mo many of you know this anyway. Um, so here's one. Um, it's actually one of our friends, because these days we always deal with linear dispersions. Uh, 
sitting on top of a uh, filled Fermi C vacuum. And if you have a linear dispersion like this, then um, we know that it costs as much energy to bring a particle at some positive momentum up here as it costs um, of um, kicking a hole or creating a hole in the vacuum down here. Yeah? They, they cost the same energy, so there should be some kind of energy balance symmetry relation. And indeed, you can now define um, C as follows, namely CP goes to C dagger, that is it, the dagger. And now comes the unitary operation, which I define as a unitary, I just define as a shift or um, exchange in momentum. So that, that, that can be unitarily represented, this P goes to minus P. <coughs> and if you write down H equals C dagger P, P, C, P, sum over P, maybe some velocity here, then it's easy to check that this guy is particle hole symmetric under this operation. So you, you, you get the spirit, right? I mean, there is really something, um, some non-trivial in the energy balance uh, going on here. Uh, while our superconductor Hamiltonian didn't have any any of this. Okay, so it 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 ho happens actually often that you have a, um, a kind of a symmetry which looks like a physical one, but it uh, just comes from from somewhere else. I mean, um, let me give you another example which is also popular in this business we are doing here. I mentioned it before. Um, Take, uh, this is a different example. I mean, take a Hamiltonian, Dirac Hamiltonian, uh, in the presence of some diagonal potential that can be di disordered or not. So you write here um, um, V, V, and here um, comp um, Px plus Ipy, Px minus Ipy. And then you realize that um, H equals sigma Y, H transpose sigma Y. And um, that is uh, the defining relation for time reversal, usually in spin one half systems. Yeah, so um, this is um, so Clark class A2, but there is no spin here. These can be spinless particles. In, a, in, a re in this context here, you would need spin one half to, to get this symmetry. Okay. So, yeah, that was this one remark. Um, now, let me. Um, um, move slowly from symmetries uh, towards topology, connect to topology, and um, I will then stop at that level because uh, from, from there on um, other lecturers take over or have taken over. Uh, so we had, we had these, oh, ah, that's it. We had, um, uh, the other day we had these um, 10 different possibilities, which I have just uh, listed here. So there's time reversal 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and then four zeros. And because we had this uh, doubling in the 0, 0 scenario, the same here with charge conjugation, such that, and um, then um, the ensuing chiral symmetry, which is, say, here positive, positive, or, or present, I should present or absent, you don't discriminate between s plus 1 and minus 1. One, 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 and, and here you can have a one or a minus one. And so these are our 10 options, and they are labeled by these um, labels which we saw many times already uh, yesterday, and I'll explain in a second where they come from, if you don't know yet. Um, now, what, what can we say in the most general terms about, I mean, really broad, I mean, Eagle's uh, uh, eye perspective? Um, first of all, let me make, I mean, a remark where applications are concerned. Um, uh, non-trivial non, non symmetries. By non-trivial, we mean, so the trivial guys are this guy, that guy, and where are you here? This one. Uh, so involving time reversal, but no, no charge conjugation. And they were present and known in the pre-90, mid-90s uh, time. The others um, came later, um, and the other symmetries <coughs> play a role in contexts where we talk about superconducting material mostly. I mean, so, so this, yes. I mean, these are the charge conjugation guys, and or 
in contexts where we have relativistic Fermi matter. When, when it gets relativistic, chiral symmetries usually pop up. Yeah? So you can, you can uh, um, yeah, let me call this chiral. You can draw an ever so broad distinction <coughs> um, and um, say, if you have a guy uh, that is um, charge conjugation symmetric but doesn't have a chiral symmetry, then chances are that it will play a role in superconductivity. Um, but <coughs> yeah, then there are others. I mean, like this one typically appears A3, is chiral. Um, is a famous, I mean, Dirac fermion and random gauge potential. That's a typical chiral application. Um, but then um, there are also uh, cases where you have both, like this. Um, so BD1 is charge conjugation and chiral. And that means that it appears in both contexts. In, we know it as the Kitaev chain. And in particle physics, it's known as the chiral GOE, which um, plays a role in lattice gauge theory. And it, 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 also, I mean, it also, in, 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 in superconducting contexts where you have chirality, it, it, it appears. So you have this kind of, on the ever so broad double, um, uh, these, these application spectra. Now, um, what else can we say in ultra, ultra general terms about um, the non-standard symmetries? Uh, the thing is that systems um, with um, C equals plus minus one and or S equals one have quantum spectra, single particles, quantum spectra that are symmetric around zero. Um, have um, spectra symmetric around around zero, and um, the reason for that is um, as follows. I mean, you, you probably know it. Suppose I have an eigenstate. Yeah, um, then uh, my Hamiltonian anticommutes with. Um, my, my C operation. So um, I can hit then psi with C, however it's implemented, I mean, in this uh, unitary matrix transposition and so on. And it will give me um, um, an eigenstate, um, an eigenstate with negative energy because the Hamiltonian anti commute. Yeah? So, so you, you, you can cook up for each epsilon a state. Um, uh, with, with different energy. And these states are then uh, naturally linearly independent because they are eigenstates to different energies. There is one exception, <coughs> zero energy. At zero energy, um, if you have a zero energy state, um, there is no telling whether this guy is um, actually a new state or whether it's the same state again. Yeah? So at zero energy, this mirror symmetry um, is, is lifted. And whenever you have... Um, a state such that uh, it has zero energy and it reproduces itself under um, the symmetry operation, it, uh, chances are that this is a topological zero mode. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's so, if you have the spectrum, um, no, let me draw it like this. It is here, um, it is symmetric around zero, but um, here you can have a zero mode setting, and once there is a zero mode here, you have probably heard this argument, then it's really nailed there. It cannot get away. It's, it's, it, there will no other state come with which it, it can hybridize. It's just sitting there and locked. That's one way of uh, motivating the topological stability. Clear so far? Questions? No? Um, one last remark on this. But, and uh, um, In one incarnation of the lecture notes, I would actually expand on that, but I don't do it now. Um, that is the following. Um, in these systems, if you explore low energy physics, and that's what we usually do, right? I mean, say, take Majorana quantum wire, experimental situation, you hope there is a Majorana sitting there, but then there are these uh, vicious Andreev bound states coming down, and you really want to know what's going on in this low energy sector here. And um, as a rule, what you should expect is pro both in disordered and non-disordered context is pronounced quantum interference phenomena going on here. So there's really um, quantum mechanics is very important down here. And the reason is that whenever one guy wants to come down, 
there is a partner coming up. And the closer they, they, the more they try to get close to zero, um, the more they see each other. They correlate uh, via the Hamiltonian. So um, very often you, you cannot get away with doing some first order perturbation theory here. Um, one really has to work a little more to understand what goes on in the low energy sector. And um, uh, there is a lot of discussion, say, in the context of uh, Majorana fermion bound states in quantum wires, what all this implies and whether it's actually Majorana or just to my Andre bound states and so on. They are seeing, yeah. So that is, and it, it's pervasive. I mean, in all symmetry classes, you have this life gets interesting close to zero. Um, zero energy. Up, up in the sky, somewhere here, they usually behave as, as, as if the symmetry wasn't there. That gives a zero energy point. Okay. Um, so, now that does that, that. Now I'm always pressing the wrong buttons. Yes. Um, now, um, let me now move from symmetry slowly to topology and connect to um, what we had, um, uh, what was already discussed yesterday in different ways. Um, and what I want to do is uh, I want to discuss now these symmetry classes first from a geometric perspective and from geometry we can then move into topology. Yeah, that's, so this geometric view is a gateway uh, into topology and that's also how things developed uh, historically. And um, so say, uh, what, what do these symmetries, uh, how can we uh, relate between these classes and something geometric? Um, and the clue is, I mean, it's a trivial remark, but it actually took some time to appreciate that this is a good idea. Uh, the idea is um, not to look at the Hamiltonian of a given symmetry class, but at its time evolution operator. Time evolution operator is an interesting guy here. So consider um, U uh, I H T under the assumption that um, H belongs to one of these classes. No? Um, so uh, what can we say? I mean, um, say if um, T C S equals zero in, in the in the in the Totally trivial setting, H is just Hermitian. So um, H equals H dagger. And uh, from that follows that U is um, in, in some uh, UN. Remember, we were n-dimensional in Hilbert space. And that's all you can say. Now, um, I would like to suggest a view where, I mean, we, we mentally, we don't think about a given Hamiltonian, but um, about an ensemble of Hamiltonians, an ensemble which is such that in our um, uh, n-dimensional space it is irreducibly represented, so we, we, we think of about all Hamiltonians at once, all symmetry allowed Hamiltonians, yeah, the, the whole lot of them. And then we create an ensemble, and if the space is really irreducible, this ensemble will fill up UN. Yeah. So we, we can say that the set of all time evolution operators sort of um, gives us a copy of UN. It sounds weird at first time, but it's, it's, a, it's a creative way of thinking about the situation. In particular, if you have a situation, uh, I mean, uh, some kind of like a maximum entropy setting where uh, you have a Hamiltonian and there is junk going and you think of, a, uh, I mean, a quantum device, and you wait for several milliseconds, then electronic degrees of freedom will have filled up the, the fully the available um, Hilbert space. We call such a system ergodic. And um, such an ergodic ensemble uh, then really um, defines a uniform measure on UN. So UN is full. Why is it useful? I'll tell you in a second. Um, okay, to, to appreciate uh, where, I mean, why this is a good way of thinking, um, let's discuss another um, um, setting, namely T, T, C, S equals um, one zero zero. So now we have time reversal sim oh dagger, this is a dagger, yeah. So now H e equals H transpose equals H dagger. So we have a symmetry under transposition. Up to some stupid unitary matrix which can be conjugated away. In this case, 
Um, we can ask the same question. I mean, suppose you have a time reversal invariant system and now you wait a long time, what will it fill? Which space? And the answer is, um, of course it's unitary. But what we want to get rid of are all anti-symmetric matrices. Anti-symmetric matrices are not tolerated. We only want to keep the symmetric guys, right? So uh, what we have to do is we have to factor out the subgroup of UN that is generated by the anti-symmetrics, and that's ON. So ON goes. Um, and we arrive at this kind of coset space. Yeah? OK. Um, now that you can, you can do this for all 10 classes, and you will um, always, in e each case, you either arrive, uh, end up with a group case, a uh, group, group manifold, um, or a coset of two classical groups, some UN over SPN or something like that. So that's not very exciting by itself. But then, um, if, we, um, if we just fill this in here, like here a UN, and um, here, say, for the fun of it, I can never remember this, um, an SP2N over a UN. I mean, you play these games. Um, you notice that uh, mathematicians have been there before. Um, the thing is that the set 10 spaces you get are called in mathematics, they are called symmetric spaces. I'll tell you in a second why they are called symmetric spaces. And um, this was all done by Carton in the uh, early uh, 20th century. And the, the, the beauty of, uh, there's lots of beauties about symmetric spaces, but um, they, they, they come in two families, compact and non-compact. These are compact spaces. They are of relevance for fermionic um, quantum matter. Side remark, there is also bosonic um, non-compact versions which appear in the context of bosons. And um, there's only 10 of them. So you, you have just 10 symmetric spaces, 10 families of symmetric spaces. And they are labeled here. This is the carton, carton notation which draws connections for those who have a sweet spot for math um, between these uh, spaces and the large families of classic Lie groups, which are, go by A, B, C, D names. That's why you have these funny labels here. And um, there are 10, and they are just parameterized by their rank. So there is a, this is the dimension of the symmetric space. But um, So 10 families of symmetric um, spaces of a given rank. And um, the realization then was that there is obviously a one-to-one -one relation between fermionic quantum symmetries and these symmetric spaces. And there's just 10 of them, and that's why we stubbornly, I mean, it's, we can prove that you won't find any other fermionic symmetries. They always belong to one of these 10 uh, groups. At this point, it's not so clear what you can buy for that knowledge, yeah? I mean, um, but actually, I mean, there's quite a lot. Um, let me briefly um, explain or discuss why they are called uh, symmetric um, spaces. I mean, this is um, the, if you want, the algebraic way of introducing them. But there is a beautiful um, a different way which connects between this ergodic maximum entropy approach and, um, and, and geometry. And um, very roughly, it goes like this. You take a symmetric space. You cannot, you cannot visualize, but suppose you could. Yeah. So here it is, um, a bit of symmetric space. And um, now you pick a point. It's just a side remark, but I like it. Um, and these, these spaces are Riemannian. They, come, they have a scalar product, they have a scalar product. So that means you have all the, you have differential geometry. In particular, you can talk about the curvature and you can talk about parallel transport. So suppose you have here a certain curvature, yeah? And now you can parallel transport um, this through any point and case, go from here to here. So. so here you get in general a different curvature, right? If you have some weird manifold, it looks the same. But now it comes. In a, a symmetric space, every point, everyone, is um, in, uh, symmetric under an isometry, under a flip. Flip of sign, I mean, the, under essentially the reversal of this geodesic. It's a symmetry point. That's a, de a, a definition, a Wikipedia definition of symmetric spaces. And that has two consequences. Um, it means that the curvature here equals the curvature there. So physically, uh, geometrically, it means the guys look the same from all perspectives. You look at them they always look the same. That's why they are called symmetric. In the physics context, these are our symmetries. Yeah, these are the discrete symmetries which flip you from, I mean, so that's why uh, these symmetries imply a highly symmetric 
uh, representation space under time evolution. Um, right. Now let me give you one concrete example where you can, so we can actually see this in a little more detail. Um, what the symmetric space is and why it is so symmetric. So consider, um, yeah? Good. I guess you could, yes, why not? I mean, if you have a parameter and you... Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I, I understand, but... Um, I would say that this is here a little bit more general. I mean, it applies even in cases where you don't have a natural connection, physically motivated connection. Yeah, so take a chaotic cavity. But yes, I mean, so, so, so. in cases where berry face um, can be, this is surely related in some way, but I, yeah. Um, let, let me give you one example. Um, and that goes as follows. Take our friend, uh, the SSH chain, which we have seen yesterday so many times. So, uh, H, um, H equals in momentum space. Um, no, we don't even need momentum space. We have here something, and here there's something bigger. Yeah? Uh, and the uh, discriminating feature is that H and um, sigma 3 um, anti-commute, so that is your car symmetry. Car symmetry. Now we ask ourselves, what symmetric space does? And, and I take it back. Let's let's do, let's be two by two. So think of this as a as a number, uh, some some block 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 number. Yeah. So um, if we if we go f down to such a small subspace, well, it's just a number. Then you can ask ourselves what. Um, uh, what space, I mean, in what space does the time evolution operator live? And the answer is, well, first of all, it's U2. I mean, U2 is clear, because this is the exponential of a two-dimensional two, 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 two Hermitian matrix, anti-Hermitian with the I. But then you want to get rid of the diagonal blocks. Yeah? And the di diagonal blocks you can remove by removing everything that's generated by sigma 3 and sigma 0. And that means that you factor out a u1 and um, times a u1. So one u1 is here, and the other one u1 is here. So that's our space. And it would appear here, you would uh, see u, u2n over un times un. So this is the um, lowest dimensional um, representation of that. And what is the space? Just to check your geometry. No. Somebody must have seen this sometimes. Nobody? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Let's remove this one U and do it like this. SU2 over U1. SU2 over U1. Um, no, SO, SO3 is up to, up to this double cover thing, which um, Andre mentioned yesterday is SU, SO3 is SU2, almost. Spin. What does a spin do? Where does it live? On a block? Sphere. This is a sphere. Yeah, you, you take, um, uh, how do you see it? You take spin, SU2, yeah, rotates everything. But now if you start from a symmetry broken state in a magnet, say, the guy is invariant under 1u1. So, um, so if you have a, a ferromagnetic substance, you have 1u1 that's going out, and the, the rest of SU2 gives you a sphere. So that's how one way of seeing that SU2 over u1 is a sphere. And the sphere arguably looks the same, but if you look at it from all perspectives. Yeah. In higher dimensional case, you would get the higher dimensional analogs of some spherish like objects here. Yeah. Good. So that was that. So now we have um, basically all we know about, need to know about symmetries and um, their uh, geometric interpretation. And we can now move on from symmetries uh, to topology and it establish the link to um, what uh, um, my colleague lecturers will 
discuss or have been discussing or and oops ah, now I I was not supposed to put I mean to, to dust this carpet here. Now I successfully did. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if I had proceeded um, according to the plan, I would now introduce my two guinea pig examples of topological insulators, SSH chain and un quantum anomalous Hall effect. But I guess you are all sick and tired of seeing them introduced, and we had them lots of times yesterday. But um, keep them in mind. I mean, there are these two guys, and um, very quickly, um, the SSH um, leads to a Hamiltonian, a chiral Hamiltonian of. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, now, now I'm really serious of this, of, of this block structure. Um, oh, no, no, I again write it in a, in, a, um, in a block momentum representation, just for explicitness. And um, that k is then typically t times e to the i k minus some mu, some complex number. And um, there is a quantum anomalous Hall effect Hamiltonian, which um, you can write it like this on, on a lattice if you, um, um, something like that, sigma x plus sine ky sigma y plus some r minus cosine kx minus cosine sigma 3, right? Now what can we say about these guys? Um, this one is an A3 Hamiltonian. And... Um, this one here is A. It doesn't have any symmetries, I mean, besides hermeticity. Uh, and now we want to understand um, um, topology. And um, there are different ways of doing that. Yeah. Um, one way that does not work is, um, is to stare at the band structure, although um, Andre is now telling us about intelligent ways of making sense of band structures, but I think we can agree that um, if we look at um, the band structure of any of those guys, then we generically have a gap somewhere here. And here we have, say, n plus unoccupied bands, n, n minus occupied bands, and the totality of n plus, plus n minus um, uh, total bands. So just staring at this will not help. What what does work, but is not very, is not the best way of going, is to do the following. You can um, think of, you can you can think of it a situation as follows. Uh, this data here, yeah, you can describe it as a map. Um, so we have a map in general of some detours. Um, say there's a Brion zone underlying here. It's one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and so on. Um, into a symmetric space, or something that is tangent to a symmetric space. I mean, essentially, and some k goes to x. Um, k, okay. uh, I t h. Okay, something like that. And now you can start um, exploring the uh, topology of that map. I mean, to, what, what do you mean by topology of map? You have here something that's topologically non-trivial in some sense. Here you have something else. And topology usually establishes relation between different topological spaces via maps. Yeah? And it can happen that your map is such, if everybody goes to unity, then it's obviously trivial. But it can happen that your map is such that um, uh, you have some, uh, you can associate some invariance to it, some power degree or whatever they have in topology. Um, that works, but it's not the best way, the, the better way. I mean, there are several better ways. And um, let me just list um, um, three of them, essentially. Um, I mean, th th three ways which I, from a practice perspective, which I think are good for describing um, topology, and several have been in use already here. Um, number one is you don't look at the Hamiltonian, but it, it's eigenstates. Eigenstates, yeah? So the eigenstates um, are, in a way, there, there is a, this is a better way of looking because it not only 
tells you something about the totality, the Hamiltonian, but um, you also have to can communicate which eigenstates are occupied and which are not. So this is the essential extra information you, you will provide in this way. And um, it goes as follows. Information on eigenstates um, is encoded in what? And let, let me um, just bring this up for class A, the simplest case. I mean, um, this one here. Um, you have for each k, um, you have um, you have a unitary matrix uh, telling you which contains the eigenstates at, at given k, yeah? and it's n-dimensional. N so it, it has the information about the eigenstates corresponding to these states here, this one, that one, that one, with these eigenvalues. Um, but then. Uh, you can argue that you, you just don't care about any basis transformations in here, which, um, which just change the labeling here and the same down here. You, what, what you're interested is about the relation of the, how these relate to each other. So that means that you can get rid of um, this coset, um, so, so you, of, of this um, factor group, which is smaller n plus plus n minus is n. And um, you naturally arrive at cosets of this type for all 10 classes. I mean, if these are, if you're living on a different symmetric space, different guys appear here and here, but it's always a structure. And they have a name, they are called Grassmannians. These are, um, this is the overarching name for these animals, these cosets built from classical groups, Grassmannians. And then, I mean, the homotopy approach to uh, topolog topology just replaces this symmetric space here by the equivalent but no, somewhat richer information um, you put here the Grassmannian. And now you explore um, the mapping from the torus into the Grassmannian space. Let me give you um, two examples. Um, um, and um, uh, tell you how this unfolds in these two cases here, here and here. Um, so, um, what, what is the Grassmannian here? Here, the, uh, here, this is a two-band model, yeah. And um, you see, you, you diagonalize it. The, the diagonalizing vector is just the eigenvector of, of these guys here, and you have one for the upper and the lower band. So the, the lower band um, eigenvector just follows the orientations described by these, and that means that the Grassmannian um, is equivalent again to a sphere. This is the information about the occupied eigenstate, and it's um, u2 over u1, u1. And our map then is a map from the two-dimensional Brion zone, the two torus, into the sphere, and these maps are classified by integer winding numbers. So, um, and yeah, so that's the, um, and I want to stress that this, fun this is the fundamental concept. The fundamental concept is homotopy. It's not Chern numbers or Barry curvature or all that. These are all languages to describe what's going on fundamentally. So fundamentally, you are, if you have a non-trivial topological phase, you have a winding. Um, as you go around the torus, you will fully cover the sphere. And this map from the torus to the sphere has a winding number one. And now you ask yourself, how do I compute you? And then you do it by the pullback of the curvature form, and that's what we call Berry phase integral or Chern number and, and all these names that go with it. But these are second order concepts, yeah? And it's important to know because sometimes you really want to be operate on the most fundamental level and not get caught up in calculations with complicated objects, yeah? No, um, in the... If you are, say, in a different symmetry class, you have to trade this guy here for the corresponding symmetric space, and that one here accordingly for smaller manifolds. Yeah. And um, the, the way, I mean, it, may, it will certainly appear sometimes during this uh, lecture, um, during this week, there is this famous periodic table of topological insulators, uh, symmetry classes versus physical dimensions, and what is going on topologically. You must have seen it. It shows up in every talk. And um, this is, um, the structure can be, or has been understood historically, from first mathematically by Bott from representation theory um, reasoning, and then by Kitaev, 
who just explored this homotopy, this homotopy um, structure systematically in terms of category theory, and then you can write down this table, yeah, uh, on very fundamental grounds, without worrying about Hamiltonians um, in detail. Here, very quickly, um, the eigenstates essentially, um, let me just describe this. They can be written as one, and then comes here essentially z over z modulus, some, something of that flavor. Um, these are the eigenstates of this animal. And now you see the Grassmannian is this, which is a unit modular number, u1. So um, uh, this is um, u1, so it's a circle. And um, what we are dealing then with is a map from the Prion zone circle into that circle, and it has a winding number if and only if uh, this is larger than one, uh, larger than mu. Yeah? So you, you can just see it. I'm just telling you in, in, in general ways what you have seen already. Um, five to ten. Oh, well, that's luxury. I thought. I'm okay. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Um, that is um, this approach. And again, I mean, once we, once we know what can be go on, on homotopic grounds, we can worry how, how to actually compute it. And I, I don't want to get carried away here, but there are these different vehicles depending on which dimension and which symmetric space we are. So for example, here you would, you would characterize the homotopy degree by a Chern number, which you have to, then to compute for a concrete mapping. Here it would be a winding number. And then there are more complicated cases, uh, especially when, if you have time reversal invariants around, where objects such as uh, known as Chern parities sneak into the game. And, but conceptually, it's always like this. Yeah? So that was approach number one. Very formal, very powerful, um, but sometimes not very rewarding if you look at one given system. The approach which all things taken into account, I, I think is, I mean, in practice, if you really have a system and you want, want to do something which often works best is a Dirac fermion, um, Dirac fermion approach. So you, that's another way of uh, getting these numbers under control, yeah? but now in a, more, um, in a more flexible manner. And the situation here is as follows. I mean, schematically, you know that for a certain value of r, namely r equals 2, this guy switches between topological sectors, so from a winding to a non-winding map. And th that can be said about pretty much any insulator, and we have seen examples um, already, and you then know that at this point there must be a gap-closing point. Um, you have a singularity. You linearize around the gap-closing point to obtain a Dirac Hamiltonian. You, you get first order zeros. Yeah? And um, say in the... In the uh, in the SSH context, you would have, say, a band structure, I don't know, um, like this above and below the transition, but then right at criticality, you have this, and um, so you, you, you're dealing with a massive Dirac fermion here, one dimensional, and you can ask yourself, can I get this number um, from this uh, Dirac fermion approach? And the answer is a, for, it's, it's a qualified yes. Um, the thing is, if you, if you compute um, the, uh, the, 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 I mean, Chern number-like objects from a, Dirac uh, from a Dirac fermion approach, you typically get the numbers wrong. Um, and that is because uh, to, to obtain, the, get the fu full winding number or Chern number, you really have to integrate over the whole structure. So if you, if you sit here, you typically get only one half of this relevant number. But you, you don't care so much actually about the number, but you want to know how the number changes if you go from one topological sector to another one, say Dirac fermion with positive mass to negative mass here. Yeah? And the, the jump, the change, integer change in the Chern number or winding number, that can be obtained from the Dirac fermion approach. That, that is why uh, we like it so much and um, can actually obtain all that's of interesting uh, topology-wise from these guys. And there is another bonus. Um, you, you, can, you often want to consider surfaces or something like that where a topological index changes as a function of an external parameter and um, you can just the same give these here some weak coordinate dependence and um, then study in some semi-classical way what, what does my Dirac fermion do at a surface as a mass interpolates from plus to minus one, plays these games and so on. Yeah, so that's 
um, in, uh, according to plan A, the lectures I would have told more about that, but we are seeing it lots of times now during this week, so I guess I can skip that. And um, then there is um, the third, ah, yeah, no, no, one more thing. The Dirac Fermion approach, we have also seen that yesterday. Titus um, explained that in a, in a pretty advanced setting, an example of this. Um, the Dirac Fermion approach can also be very fruitful in exploring structures in this periodic table of insulators. What's going on? Let me just give you the idea. Um, say, I take a quantum anomalous Hall effect Hamiltonian, describe it by Dirac Fermion like this, and then um, uh, what I can do is I can, um, this is a game known as dimensional reduction, I can just decide for the fun of it to wrap up my surface and to build a cylinder out of it, yeah? And um, in that case, one of the momenta will be frozen out if I go to low excitation energy. So I go from a generally massless fermion in 2D to a generally massive fermion in one dimension lower. And if you do this um, in this concrete setting here, you gave, go from an A system in D2 to an A3 in D1. So if, 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 you, if you go into it and write down here the Dirac, Dirac Hamiltonian corresponding to a compactification like this, of that one you go from here to here. And if you look into the periodic table, you have entries like um, A, A3, and um, no, let me do it. This is A3, A, and here you have dimensions uh, one and two, and you, you have structures like that. They always appear in this diagonal. You, you must see them, there's always this. And um, so that would be an example how by dimensional reduction you go from an A in Z2 to an A3 in same, um, same index, same one in, um, topological number in one dimension lower in different symmetry class. Yeah? So that's again a Dirac game, which one can do. Um, okay, so let me, uh, this is all very superficial, yeah? Mm -hmm. Ah, um, the thing is, if you, if you do this here and um, you trade one of these guys by a constant um, and, um, and then require that for low energies, this constant should be zero because you, you don't want to pay this high excitation energy price, yeah? Then you basically keep this one, you kill that guy and you, this becomes unity. And now you have a Hamiltonian which has only sigma x and sigma 3 in it, and therefore anti-commute to sigma 2. And that's an, an chiral one, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right, and um, last minute, final remark, and that's what I will come back to. When is my next? Tomorrow? Tomorrow, Tomorrow. okay. So next, next lecture. Um, uh, what, what do we do when we have uh, impurities? If we have impurities around a disorder, um, all this goes bust. Yeah, you don't have any premium zone anymore. And uh, you really have to start thinking again what, what to do. And uh, the teaser answer, because that's what I want to explain um, and tomorrow, is that in this case, you really, you, you again have a map into some symmetric space, but you drop the torus side because it doesn't exist anymore. And instead, you should work in a pure real space setting and um, replace this momentum by certain gauge fluxes, real space gauge fluxes, which you, and this then leads to this, um, you remember, uh, there was a talk by Jens where we had symmetric spaces, one column, um, the native symmetric space, and there was this other column on linear sequence. So, so this is then the, the game, um, the, the approach to follow, purely real space. But um, topology can, of course, n not change. If you have a bit of dirt in the system, um, topologically, it's still the same. Um, so we, we just need a different approach. And um, that's then what I will talk about tomorrow. Okay, I stop here. Thanks.